Okay, this is episode 29 of Oversight. Usual host, Thorin. Usual co-host, Monte Cristo. This time from an undisclosed location. You can't find me, I'm sorry. Don't know if anyone wanted to, but <laughs> if they did, they can't. Okay? I mean, you so, did for the show. So. Okay. so you're playing the role of effect at the moment, then? Uh, we know where effect is, so though. <laughs> oh, right. That's... You just can't get him to come out, right? It's sort of like, you know... <laughs> So it's actually opposite effect. You don't know where I am, but I'm showing up to do this show. Whereas effect, you do know where he is, but he's not showing up to play. But the similarity is we do have to cater everything to you. Otherwise, it'll just be fucking <laughs> un, un, untenable. <laughs> completely untenable. That's true. That's true. And That's also, true. <laughs> some people do say you are the only consistently good part of the show, Monty. And they wish the other parts had been removed. So the analogy works. It, it, it works from top to bottom. In fact, some people say, what were the other people even doing there? Referring to me. <laughs> but again, I have... Nepotism has allowed me also to remain in this business money. <laughs> so, okay, our guests for this episode, because I'm trying to, it's like I'm relearning how to be a host because we went way too far with the banter and kept forgetting to ever introduce the guests. So I'll do it correctly, Monty. So in the bottom left-hand corner, we have got Kai Kai. Now, he used to be a pro player. He used to play for Cloud9. Obviously, this is in the pre-Overwatch days, so pro is a more tenuous term. He was playing for Cloud9, actually was replaced by our other guest gods, but then went on to become the coach of Envious, you know, successful team, and then played a very strange role because in the Overwatch League, he was sort of the Schrodinger's cat of coaches because <laughs> the uh, power he, he, sim <laughs> he simultaneously was always in control of the team and yet at some point was granted control of the team so i guess unless you were inside the box of dallas fuel no one you'll ever know which state it was you know we can never know <laughs> it's all about the observer effect on that one money i can't i can't do anything on that and of course our other guest is gods who was also someone playing in the early days of the scene the infamous N nrg lineup and then we had Cloud9, as I said, replacing Kai Kai here. And then Come more on. recently, listen, <laughs> he's really factual. Good, you know, I can't, he's not I can't do anything about that. It's just factual. <laughs> I'm you know. thinking about it now. You know. <laughs> I hope you like well, hearing that. Cause... Thinking about the what ifs of where, where things could have gone. <laughs> so, okay, Gods has obviously been playing this season in contenders for the Gladiators Legion, right? Isn't that the name of the contenders team? Oh, yeah, you got it. There we go. Even though that doesn't make sense because the gladiators were never actually forming legions. In fact, the legions were the military of Rome and not well, the gladiators. It would, it would actually, actually be better. Name. Yeah, no, that's the problem is, Monty. It would actually be better to be a legionnaire than to be a gladiator. Yes. Because a gladiator yes. is a slave who just fights <laughs> for his freedom. <laughs> Legionnaires, uh, you know, received land at the end of their campaigns. You know cool. what I learned? I've been reading yeah. this book about ancient Rome because I like ancient Rome. And I realized that one of the problems with the the old republic of Rome before and one of the reasons that allowed Julius Caesar to take over in the end was because they changed the way they recruited legionnaires from landholders. So previously you had to own land. <laughs> and be a citizen to enter the military. But right. then they said, fuck that, we don't have enough people. So instead, we are going to take unlanded people, and at the end of our victorious campaign, we will. it's the general's responsibility to give them land, which resulted in the legionnaires being very loyal to the general, because that means that they are going to get land via the general's grace at the end of the campaign, which made him more like private militias, which is why Caesar had so much control over his legions, because basically the generals had undying loyalty because they were responsible for dividing the spoils. And that was one of the major reasons of the fall of the Roman Republic. So there you I go. I also actually do, <laughs> like, I haven't read any books on the subject, nor do I care, but there was actually one piece of trivia I do remember, which is that apparently in the olden days we're talking about of antiquity, like salt was actually considered a form of currency and they used to pay Roman soldiers in salt. So I don't know if in the Gladiators Legion they are paid in salt or if in fact salt was already the currency they operated in, but it ties in. So I've, this, I've, this I've is quite the intro, back. Gods. Yeah, it is. So, so, so <laughs> Mine's way so longer other, than yours. I don't know why. They don't have the other, a history the other, lesson on the name or something? Like, the, other, the other fun fact about Roman legions is the word decimate comes from the Roman legions because... When a legion ran in cowardice from battle, 
they would kill at random one of 10 men of every military unit that fled in fear or cowardice. So that's where See, the word decimate See, if Kai had known this approach had success, he could have done a lot of things differently in the Dallas Fuel, you know what I mean? I feel like... Taking the unlanded players. Exactly, yes. And then whoever's and that actually, left is loyal. The unlanded players would have been more loyal to you. If the problem was is you had all these landed veterans that had it's championship true. titles... You needed the young, hungry players, right? That you that you were to divide the land amongst, right? Once you conquered. Who's to say that I didn't want that, though? <laughs> well, we'll never know if you had control or didn't have control. So exactly. Listen, until you do some sort of an AMA, you'll never have your say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a rough the, life. That's the only way you can communicate with this community. So, okay, let, obviously, at the beginning, we want to know some things about you guys. So, how about this? To start off with, since Monty still maintains a ludicrous level of elitism where he will never watch anything below what he considers the top tier of, <laughs> of watch. So, when he was in Apex, he would just uh, say stuff like, who the fuck's selfless? It's like, oh, they've been winning a few tournaments, Monty. Ah, they're not even in Apex. It's like, he does that now, even within the brand of Blizzard and Overwatch. So he doesn't watch Contenders. But since Gods has played in Contenders, and he played against the Optic Academy team, which is the one that has Kaiser on, if anyone remembers that guy, can you give us a little bit of insight into what Contenders was like, Gods? <clears throat> well, I'd say there's... It's kind of interesting because there's a few good players, um, maybe like 10 to 15 players that could easily compete in Overwatch League, but they're kind of spread out across all the teams. I don't think there's really any team, uh, despite uh, Philly winning pretty handily the entire thing, but I don't think there's any team that's really stacked out in Contenders, and a lot of the matches are actually not worth watching, in my opinion, because of that. Um, okay. A lot of it is pretty low level. I think if you had a, a powerhouse team of all the best players from contenders, it could easily contend with um, Overwatch League teams. But at this point, I think there's, contenders has a long way to go before it's really worth using for scouting, I guess, unless you're just looking at individuals. Were the contenders teams, like, was your team, for example, scouted individually? Because, I mean, I noticed it had, like, a bunch of your ex-teammates and it had, like, Pooks and Rolf and, you know, what, did you... Did, did someone just put this team together themselves? Did the org scout it? How did how did it get put together? Uh, I think it was a mixture of the players that were in early, in the process of the team being made, having a say in the players that were brought in. Um, and obviously, I think as the, the roster was kind of pieced together, um, more and more players started bringing in other players they're comfortable with. So you might have started off with one player, but he brought in someone he's comfortable with, and that guy brought in someone. And obviously, there was a tryout process. It wasn't just like a group of friends bringing their friends in. Um, but in the end, I think the synergy from that really helped us out. Okay, right. I, I, I am capable of just asking these questions because I, I get to play the naive idiot. So, gods, why weren't you in the Overwatch League? <laughs> That's a complex question. I think my identity as a player at that time was not really solidified. I think I had kind of. In the last six months before the tryouts for Watch League started happening, I think I kind of hopped around in quite a few different roles and kind of experimented. But at that time of the tryouts, I personally don't feel like I was ready. I don't feel like I deserved on a spot on any of those teams. And uh, I think it's just been important for me moving forward to like realize my mistakes in the past and try to learn from them for the next signing window. Well, because it seems likely that you're going to be one of the top players to be signed to an Overwatch League team once the expansion comes out, too, because you're one of the top and like most well-known players in the contender scene. I want to go back to what you were saying about contenders, where you don't think it's like a good scouting ground right now. So there's been a lot of, obviously, discussion about what contenders means as a sort of path to pro for Overwatch League. What, do you think that's been successful? Do you feel like you've got an experience that is going to help you uh, be on an OWL team for next season? For me personally, yeah. Um, but a lot of it didn't have to do much with the gameplay. I, I learned a lot about myself and what my role is going to be within a team. And there's a lot of intangible things I think that I can add to a team environment and the culture that I couldn't add before. Um, so in that way, I've like matured as a, as a player. But I do feel like my gameplay has taken a hit from playing against competition that's not as mechanically gifted or not as... Uh, their strategies are not as complex, I guess, as the Overwatch League teams. So, in a way, I think it's kind of hard for newer players that are trying to be de like trying to develop their own skills in the scene uh, to get to the point where they are worthy of Overwatch League tryouts. 
So you see a lot of open teams and stuff are just not even worth scrimming, for example, because they're just so far behind even contenders teams. Do you ever play against the Gladiators itself to get some of that practice in? Uh, we have, but the issue is that obviously scrimming cross patch has been a major problem. So right. That's especially true. like with the recent patches where um, flex players in, in Overwatch League have been playing D.Va only, but then in contenders and whatnot, since the Brigida was released, uh, we've been flexing around a lot more. And so it's not even really worth it for a contender scream to uh, team to scrim their uh, Overwatch League team because they wouldn't necessarily even be playing the same heroes. So it, it can be there's a lot of cross contamination, I guess, with the hero pools and stuff like that. So when when the patches line up, it's really good practice. Definitely. Because you know, I've like, I've heard um, I've heard a lot of the owl teams actually use their contenders teams to scout strategies in advance because you guys get the patches first. Generally speaking, has that been true? Do they come to you and try and talk to talk about strategy or ways to use the new heroes because you get your hands on them first? Not me uh, specifically, but I do know that they've used resources that we've gotten uh, data and whatnot. When you said there was like, I can't remember what number, 10 or something, good players, are these like the players we know, like people like you who already have played at a pro level? Are there actually like people we've never heard of before who are actually pretty good and probably going to end up in Owl? Do you have any kind of names you could give us? Uh, there's definitely some really good young talent, but they are young, uh, too young for Overwatch League, even at this point. Um, I think a lot of teams in Overwatch League wouldn't benefit too much from supplementing their roster or replacing players. Um, you have you have people like Sharp who are just like an insane DPS, right? But he's I believe 16, so he's not even eligible. Um, but for the most part, it's not like there aren't just players and contenders where you're just like, wow, that guy is so much better than his counterpart in the Overwatch League. But um, obviously, you have players like Rolf who are just you know, really, really talented, really, really skilled, and have been around uh -huh. for a long time. Who, in my opinion, deserved uh, a shot in the Overwatch League. I was League. really surprised he wasn't an owl. <laughs> yeah, so was I. Yeah. But then you have. Um, his counterpart on other contenders teams are not really close in most cases. So, Okay. Kai Kai, in Dallas Fuel, obviously this is a team that at some point in time was looking for players to potentially bring in. Did you ever consider any of the contenders players? Uh, we actually tried out Guts at, uh, in stage two. And... What happened? How are you going to do it? Uh, <laughs> you really got to put him on the so, spot. Wow, okay. <laughs> so it was like, it was really close to the deadline. And it was like, um, at this time, I really don't know how to say this politically, but I, I guess like Siegel really wasn't, we didn't know if he was going to keep playing or not. Okay. Um, so we needed a second flex player. That's when we tried out Gods. And in my opinion, I think he did well. He's got a different play style than Mickey, where Mickey's kind of like hyper aggressive, as people know. He likes to like go for backlines, whereas God is a much more passive, uh, defensive flex player. I didn't mind it. I think that God's contributed a lot, even more than some of the teammates to uh, like strategy discussions and stuff like that. So I really liked having him, but um, I think at the end, like it got to a point where we were just like, okay. We need to like focus on rebuilding the team, and because the team was in a very bad state even then, and we just decided to drop all the tryouts, and just that was it. <laughs> so wasn't nobody, you, did, you didn't pick up anybody out of that situation, clearly. No, uh, I think Gaz was actually the only contenders player we tried out. We tried out hmm. maybe another player. I don't know, it's so long ago. I do like the fact that you were like, man, this team's fucking dysfunctional. Let's get some more NRG players in here. I'll <laughs> sort, this, sort this mess right out. You know, I'll have this all fixed tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I, I have a very strong belief that like, kind of like what Gaz was saying, that like with the contenders players keeping up with the out players, but I actually do think that you could take a lot of like, I'm pretty sure I could take six contenders players right now and have them be a better team than some of the out teams. I think like, a lot of like owl players have gotten this understanding of like, yeah. oh, I'm an owl now. I I've made it. I don't need to put my life into the game anymore. And it's it's so bad. It's such a bad mindset, and it's like almost impossible to work with. Because in I don't know if it's just Overwatch or if it's esports in general, but uh, staff coaching for the most part, they really have no, like the players have infinitely more power and control than than the staff. So you can't just like take them out of that at all you can't discipline them you're not really allowed to discipline them so okay see monty he was so close to giving us the straight fire reddit 
clickbait <laughs> headline. All he had to say was, I could take six players out of contenders and make them better than the Dallas Fuel. Was, <laughs> if he had just said that, the headline's there. That's all we need. That's I mean, the title right. of the episode. That's everything. If they run out of wrist attack on Anubis, they could definitely do that, but... <laughs> Like, okay, here's the de- thing, Kai Kai. I've ever seen. <laughs> we actually did try to get you on in a past episode when the whole fuel thing was going on, precisely because in your circumstance, there wasn't really a good outlet to kind of like address a lot of the community criticisms, you know, or to give kind of an insight as to what you thought. And obviously that whole thing, that they tried to put a lid on it at Dallas. Who knows how well that worked out. Now that you're not with them, what can you say about the time that you were there and kind of what your role within it, like for a start off, the thing I joked about at the beginning, how would you explain the way that was, uh, that was addressed? Because on the one hand, there was this tweet, which Monty's referenced many times where Hastro says something along the lines of like, you know, Kai Kai now has full control of the roster, but then in the air, may I believe he implied that like, you know, it was the other way, like at the beginning you had full control or something. And then towards the end, he was listening to the players. So even the timeline seemed a bit confused. So what, what would you say about that? Uh, I don't I don't really feel like I should get too into detail about a lot of the stuff but if I had to talk about control I would say that I never really the only control the most control I had from beginning to end was just like maybe who was gonna play week by week but not every week and then I didn't really have any control to change some players or add players sometimes I mean it, <laughs> I don't know. Like I, my, I felt very suppressed in what I was able to do and what I was able to control. So okay. So you didn't. The the answer is you didn't have total control, like straight up. Like even even things that you would think a coach has. So let's talk about this instead. Let's not try and like, I let's let's try and delve into what what you think Hastro was trying to do. Was there some sort of like philosophy that he had about how this team was going to be run based on previous success? Because obviously the roster had worked previously, so you can't, it's not totally unreasonable because you you were added later into the roster process after they had already won tournaments, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you think the philosophy for running the team was based on their prior success? And do you think that affected how decisions were being made yeah, during Overwatch League. Uh, yeah, so Mike's philosophy, which I don't know if it's the right or wrong one, it doesn't really matter, but his philosophy was that he wanted a coach that was going to be like uh, a teammate and be kind of like a teammate to the players and just like keep them in better spirits, I guess. Whereas my philosophy was like, I actually like, when I saw that like they were becoming complacent at the start of Overwatch League, I wanted to become like more and more disciplined, and that really was just kind of like shut down. And I think the philosophies kind of clashed in the end, and they had like it led to some problems between me and me and the org, and eventually like this is how we got where we are. So, I mean, I do think that it's somewhat understandable from his perspective. Like I said, given the historic. The hist- like I don't agree with it, but I do understand where he could be coming from, from the historic like success of the team and then moving into Overwatch League. Because there's such a step up between what happened before in Overwatch and Overwatch League in terms of lifestyle, necessary practice regimen, uh, infrastructure surrounding the players. And it was a pretty sudden leap into like having discipline, which I think is one of the things that Boston has done so well, is that they set that expectation immediately and then picked up a bunch of players who are willing to work in that like very vertical system underneath Huck. Um, and the the system, I think, that Envy had was not was well suited towards the fly around the world and play tournaments lifestyle. It was not very well suited to a day in day out grinding Overwatch League lifestyle. Would you agree with that? I, I would because when you're flying around the world, there's like a lot more like fun stuff and and new experiences, and everyone's kind of like motivated to go to the next place. Whereas in Overwatch League, it's kind of like an actual job where you wake up, you go to work, you you grind, and then you go home and and you repeat, repeat, repeat. So people start to like get in this mindset of like, oh, I'm just like a, like Mickey referred to himself a lot as like a salary man. So (laughs) people people don't really feel the same way once you're in Overwatch League as you did prior. 
Okay. Right, Monty, I've actually got an anecdote along these lines about Hastral, which might elucidate something about his personality that people won't have heard because it's from Counter-Strike, okay? And when, by the way, when I say all this, I'll give the caveat at the beginning. I actually like Astro. I've always got along pretty well with Yeah, him. I like Astro too. CS, CS Go. Don't necessarily agree with some of the things he's done with his teams, but that's that's separate from the personality. Like, now, like his personality and also he, <coughs> he legitimately is a person who wants the best for his players and teams. Like they, there's never been anything malicious. Like I don't agree with his decisions, but he's not like a bad person. I agree. So, he's, he's a really good person. So I did an interview with him, right, where I think this was in, I think it was in 2016, and the main thrust of the interview was about the CS Score team. And in 2016 was the year where they'd won the major the year before, and then they'd kept the core of that team. And basically, the next year things had gone really badly. Like they went out of the majors in last place in CS Score. Like the best sort of result they would usually have would be like maybe they could make like a top eight at a tournament, and they'd still get eliminated. So even though they had some really good players and they had a collection of like veterans, so somewhat similar case to this. They were just doing really poorly in the game and no one could figure it out. And on in this interview, when I asked Castro about sort of his philosophy with players, he tells this really weird story where he says, oh, you know, like part of his philosophy basically is like, is to be friends with the players and to like really get to know a player like on a personal level. And he tells this story about how at one of the CSGO majors, right, at the time he had the CSGO player Shox, who is like a legendary player, but he's also infamous for being one of those like ridiculous natural talents where when they're feeling it and then, you know, things are going well, like say the first three months of a team, yeah, they're practicing, they're into it, but when they just don't feel it, they can just play without doing any practice, still be really good in the game, but obviously that has like a knock-on effect on some teammates where it's not going to be as good. So anyway, he points out about how, you know, maintaining this relationship with Shox is really important and about how when they were at the major, Shox was like, oh, like, I, I won't do the French accent, but he basically just said, you know, come on out tonight, like, let's go out to this nightclub. Because they're in, they're in Katowice in Poland. He goes, let's go out to this nightclub. And then Hastro's like, yeah, but we've got the game tomorrow in the playoffs. And then Shox is like, listen, just trust me. I'll play great. Don't worry about it. So they go out to the nightclub. They, like, they're just going ham in the nightclub. Like, he's just buying Shox, like, bottle after bottle after bottle. Shox is, like, picking up women and stuff in this nightclub because he's just shocks. <laughs> if you know this guy, he's, he's unreal. He's like some, some out of a fucking Zoolander movie or something. But anyway, so... So the mad part about this detail is I'm thinking like, where's this story going? Like, there must be like a key moment where they're going to bond. And this is like, this must fix the team going forward. <laughs> and at the end of the story, he goes, yeah. And so anyway, yeah, we did seal pretty late. You know, we had a hangover the next day, but he played all right in the game. And I go, I think, wait, didn't you lose that game though, Hastro? Wasn't that like the semifinals where you got beat by Nip? And I think he even just like, I, I don't remember. And I'm like, what the fuck? Why, why are you even telling me that anecdote? That's actually a ridiculous, what, what was the point of that? What was the point? Like, you basically just went out clubbing with him and then lost the game. Like, I don't actually understand what I was supposed to get out of this. Like, I was I was listening so intently as well. I was thinking, like, there's going to be some epic moment in this, you know, where he realizes something about brotherhood or... And it, there was nothing. It was just... It, I mean, it basically made him sound like he was just like, yeah, just let them do whatever they want. Do I get I mean, a it does come, He is it, Like, Hastro was a former Call of Duty player, which For I think sure, is yes. where a lot of his philosophy comes from, which is that he wants to have... His organization wants, wants to be the one that is like the player's first, player's freedom organization. But yes. unfortunately, I think the reality is, is that when you have a bunch of, like, teenagers who don't have much life experience or discipline and have spent their entire lives playing video games, you can't have that and be a functional org that is going to, uh, you know, be a championship caliber organization in, in something like the Overwatch League that where everyone else is, it's an arms race for the best infrastructure and coaches and uh, practice schedule and everything like that. So I, I think those days are sort of behind us and it's it's going to take probably a rebuild of, of NV to, to fix a lot of these issues. Well, at least in Overwatch. I mean, I can tell you in CSGO, I still sometimes see people where I have like the first games off. So I'm in the club at 4 a.m. And I'm like, well, that guy's played in like five hours. St that still happens in CSGO <laughs> money. Like some players are outrageous. <laughs> and I won't say what teams they're from, but they've got like a coordinated hand signal. So you can figure it out from that. <laughs> right. Okay. Gods, what do you think of this then? Since I don't want to like torture Kai Kai too much. You obviously know some of the people in Envious, played with some of them before. What did you think as an outsider with all the problems they had in Fuel? I mean... Kind of, kind of unbelievable how the much they underachieved. I definitely think that it, it's hard not to be a little bit arrogant or a little bit secure when you've been a champion in a game for you know a year. 
when you're the best team by far, just naturally, it, it's hard not to move into something that feels the same and not have that kind of attitude. I do think that players in general in Overwatch definitely don't keep that hunger that Kaikai Kai was talking about earlier. Um, and that hunger can be hard to maintain. It's a competitive thing for sure. But if you become lazy or complacent, there are a lot of people that are ready to take your place and they're ready to beat you in the league. So I definitely think that it's true for anyone that you would get a little bit comfortable. But I definitely think that they could have done more. They could have done a lot better, especially in the <laughs> last few stages. Huh. Could have done better. <laughs> I think I think so. I mean, I still remember a lot of the Dallas Fuel players of like these, you know, godlike performances and that I played against, you know, or what I felt like were godlike performances at the time. Yeah. And so I, I still think of them that way, but they can't think of themselves in that way, if that makes sense. Man, I think that everyone in Dallas understands that they're a good player and they're capable of a lot, but I feel like what is actually holding them back is so beneath like what will ever be seen by the public that there's not even really a sense to talk about it to me, for me at least. As an outsider now, what would you say that like it's a scenario where you have to just like reboot the whole team, like top most people start over make a new core it can you salvage most players could you just change like one or two and, and turn things around what would your thoughts be you don't have to name names by the way this isn't Are about asking me or him no <laughs> anyone. well anyone oh, i mean <laughs> anyone i think that at this point i feel like the whole team needs to be torn apart and just rebuilt. Like, I don't think there's really any other way to make it work at this point. I mean, obviously, for, for the joke, I should have just set it up like... like I think, like, I think I imagine players, you were in control of this team. What would you do, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> imagine I was in control. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, I think that the team, at least, like, the core majority, majority could have worked at the start of Overwatch League going forward, but I feel like there had to be, like, a clear change going in to where, like, okay, this is Overwatch League now. It's not the same. That's like what I really wanted to do. Um, at this point, I feel like it's gotten so deep where the whole team, like I think all the players could could like stay in Overwatch League, but I don't think they can stay on a team together. I feel like it's just not good for their for their own personal mindsets. I don't think it's good for a team environment. Like what I noticed was even like bringing in a lot of tryouts and new players like XQC, Custa, and and all them. Like bringing in those new players, they were so scared to like like maybe do some shot calling or, or talk about strategies because they were so scared of like this team that's been together for so long just kind of like outcasting them or shutting them out so like i don't i think even though dallas has as i guess failed at this point i still think that like a lot of new players will keep that mindset coming in of like where it's like the core of envy versus them okay. so i just think it's best for all parties that like the team just rebuilds i think it's best for the players and the org the team like everyone what do you think, Monty? Do you think they have to start from scratch? Yeah, I just, like I said, like Kyle's saying, I think that if there had been a clear transition in terms of the their practice schedule and a chain of command at the start of the season where there was going to be more discipline, but I think that right now, because it's, it's very hard, I think, to implement disciplinary measures after the fact, and especially after a whole season of playing in the league, um, I mean, I question even what's like what's going on with effect right now. Oh, there's been a lot of speculation. I mean, the fans love to say, "Oh, you know, and, you know, we need we." It, it seems like a mental health issue. Obviously, nobody could know that. Um, it, and I hope that if it, there is a mental health issue involved, that he is getting appropriate treatment. But at the same time, having your arguably your star player not play apparently because it seems like rumor is he's not coming back for stage four not play for half the season doesn't seem like it's a very good way to first off have a structure where the players are performing their jobs as expected and second off the special treatment of a player who continues to get paid while his teammates are playing and, and staying in california i just don't understand how you 
explain that to the players that are staying and continuing to play unless you're actually saying to the other players like, oh, Effect has got his position. He doesn't need to be here right now. He's he's back in Korea sorting his own stuff out. The rest of you are fighting for, um, you know, slots on this lineup for next year, which also seems like a pretty unhealthy way to operate a team, in my opinion. So I I think like it's really screwed up now. Um, And I think you do pretty much have to blow it up. But the again, we we can't know specifically what's going on with effect. But even the appearance of favoritism in that situation, I think, is pretty bad. I think what you do is you go the other way, Monty. You're trying to be too professional here. What you do is, first of all, you make the best of a bad situation. So you remember how in League of Legends, when Team Liquid had a season where everything went badly, at the time they'd been filming to do a reality show, but when they realized everything was going to shit, they just turned the reality show into what is an epic documentary called Breaking Point. And by the Which way- Which everyone should watch. It's even a- if you don't care about League of Legends, don't worry, there's barely any League of Legends in it. It's just a team disintegrating and you get to see it all. It's glorious. And by the way, there's a coach in that one that gets completely reamed out. You know, like No one's listening to him. People go over his head all the time. So all I'm saying, is you know people might be able to relate but anyway what i was going to say was what you do is first of all for stage four you film everything and you put out like a like a mega like wwe raw generation style thing of like all the bad blood and stuff then you simultaneously run a show where you say right i'm only going to keep effect and one teammate and then it's essentially like the bachelorette all the other teammates have to prove to effect that he can trust them and that they've got his back and then he gives one rose to one of the players at the end of the season and then they join him making the new dallas fuel for next season that's my idea (laughs) <laughs> I love it. Call and also, of course, you'd have the different strategies. Mickey would be like trying to be the nice, you know, course, cheer up yeah. teammate. Uh, you know, you'd have the other guys like practicing really hard, focusing on their in-game skills in order to make it. Be, it'd be interesting. AKM would be in the diary room all the time. Oh, fucking effect. I hope he doesn't pick me. And then I hope I get onto the LA Valley. And then he comes out, you know, you are aware effect gets to see those, right? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be my dream anyway. Right. Obviously, Kai Kai's been enough, through enough, Monty. Let's move the topic on to other teams in the Overwatch League. How about the Houston Outlaws, the team that he's on now? And True. his fellow, yes. you know, many of his players that he selected for the USA World Cup team that he has now been reunited with, so. Yeah, what about that then? What about joining the Houston Outlaws? Uh, almost immediately after the announcement of me being released from Dallas, they contacted me and... I almost pretty much immediately started working with them, which coincidentally was the same week that Houston played Dallas. So it kind of felt weird for me. Uh, I mean, Houston compared to Dallas, I I think I'm much happier, less stressed on this team. I feel like I have much more freedom to kind of like look for areas of weakness and kind of like fix them and just like focus on them and not have to worry about like little drama problems or like whatever PR problem happened that day or whatever. So. I think it's a much healthier environment for me. Uh, I don't know, like going back to playing Dallas that week though, I have to say like, I thought it would feel good to beat Dallas, but it actually felt terrible for me. And even though like I, I contributed a lot to to that match specifically for, for Houston, but I think I still feel like, I really like the players on Dallas still. and. I don't know, man. That that winning that game just felt terrible for me. Like I didn't feel good about it. So I don't know. It's it's been a weird transition. Very depressing story. Okay. It's been it's been a very weird transition because it's kind of like at that time I still felt very like emotionally attached to Dallas, and I felt like I felt like I knew what could fix Dallas, and like I really wanted to fix Dallas, but it it's it just weird. Like I don't know how to just like explain it all without going into like bad areas, but. Huh. Okay. I've it's got all a right. For you. you get we you can uh, you can save all this for your reflections interview with Thorin in like a year when everything's blown over, and that's when you can. Have passed that <laughs> <way>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, what about this then? So obviously Arhan is signed to the roster, but didn't play in the last stage. Does he have his visa yet? Will he start in in stage four soon? Will it be at the beginning? Do you have any information for us? The only information I have about that is that I think Arhan gets his visa this week. I think. I mean, I, I'm not too in the loop. Like, I, I'm kind of just like, 
I'm trying to avoid the whole like head coach versus head coach thing. I'm kind of just like trying to make, I'm trying to like be Tyrong's helper right now. I'm trying to like force myself into that role and just kind of like help him with whatever he needs help with. I, I'm like diagnosing my own areas of weakness and I'm bringing it to him or I'm just like doing stuff, but I'm trying not to step on his toes. So I'm not gonna be like, Tyrone, we're, what's up with our Hans visa? We need it now, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know, I'm trying to avoid that. Okay. Gods, what, obviously Arhan was a player on the Freaker back in the days when you were over in Apex. Did you actually rate him as a player? Did you think he was good? No. He wasn't? I didn't think he was good. <laughs> You're like Monty, you were just a hater of a Freaker <laughs> player, um, basically. <laughs> um, no, I mean, he had a bit of a reputation back then of uh, kind of gassing himself up, but not really having that same confidence from other players, even on his team. So, no, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in Arhan, but... I guess we'll we'll see. I've been wrong before, so. I don't think you're going to be wrong about this, but that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) People can change. I don't think I'm going to be wrong either. People evolve. I'm not. I'm not too into the loop about like why Arhan was picked. I haven't really asked, but I do know that like from the short time I've been here, that he has contributed a lot to like giving feedback to players through Tyrong and also strategy stuff. And uh, he's also like always available during in-house scrims and he's always there he's always trying i don't know like as a teammate so far from like what i've seen i think he's fine i mean there were speculations that he was going to be less of a active player and more of a player coach for the team um which I, is sounds like no <laughs> what he's been doing so far yeah well i mean he obviously can't play with you right now but it sounds like that's what he's doing that's what he's doing so far I think I he's doing. I think he's doing a lot more than what's expected of him right now, given that he doesn't have a visa yet. Fair enough. Do you have any more questions about the Houston Outlaws, Monty? Uh, no, actually, you know what? Uh, before we go into more specific teams, I think we should address the whole like patch situation that's going yes. on right now, okay. because I think that's like a really interesting conversation that we can have with uh, an owl coach and also a, a contenders player, because. There have been like a lot of issues, I think, surrounding the patching of of Overwatch League, and I think we have to sort of start at the at the base level, which is that, and and Kai Kai can confirm this, is that a lot of the Overwatch League teams have asked for the patches not to change in the middle of a stage. So for fans trying to understand how this works, Basically, Blizzard doesn't want to change patches in the middle of a five-week stage because the teams and players have requested that that not happen. So when we sort of start a stage, it's resulted in us being locked in. Now, I personally disagree with this, um, but only in a world where most major patch changes happen in between stages and maybe minor tweaks or improvements happen during a stage. Like, we don't want a situation where we get, like, a new hero in the middle of a stage, I think. Um, but the patching cycle, I think, has not been done particularly well by Blizzard to this point. Now, it's also important to note that there are a lot of considerations from Blizzard's end. Uh, clearly, I think they know it's not ideal, but they need to make sure because with Overwatch League, at least, they have to create a build for the patch that goes on the local server that they use. And that server frequently, like it does have a much higher tick rate. It behaves differently than other servers. So it does take them time to create a build for that server um, and make sure that it's stable and not going to crash or create other problems. So there's, it's a very complicated system right now, but what are your general thoughts on, on patching, Kai Kai? How would you like Blizzard to patch in an ideal world? I think that like, uh, I think that ultimately like the patches have to align with Overwatch League in some way. I think I gave like some feedback on the, on the Overwatch League Discord like last week about it, where I think that just like, uh, they can do stuff like bug fixes in the middle of a the stage. They can do stuff like putting new heroes, new game modes on PTR during the middle of a, like a stage, just to like keep the casual fan base like more like happy, I guess. But ultimately, I think between stages, if they want to go the route of not changing patches on in stages, which I think is fine personally, I think that most players think that just because like it reduces the practice time. But ultimately, like you want the live patch to be what's being played, like almost all the time like as much as possible because like it affects player practicing on their own time like if they're doing ranked you want to be playing on the same patch or playing competitively and also just like viewership like fans don't really want to watch a patch that was that was from months ago like all these problems like 
like the players are actually affected by the bleeding viewership because they feel like their value is being like lessened in a way. So there's just so many like little things that are going into this. But yeah, I mean, right now, uh, it's, right now is like a whole different situation because we're still between stages and we're not like we're not even switching to the live patch. We're still playing on an or like being told we're possibly playing on an older patch. That's what I don't understand. Let's let's be clear. As of the recording of this show, you don't know which patch you're playing on. Uh, yes, on May 14th at 1 p.m. <laughs> I did not clear, know what patch we're playing. The first match is start win. May 16th at 4 p.m. Yeah. So uh, we we were told we were told that a that until further notice expect to be playing on 1.22, but it make it made it sound like they're they're still talking about it, which I know they're still talking about it. It made it feel like it could still change, and that's yes. the problem. And we're still we're just asking for updates, and they're not really helping us well, out there. But but again, this is a this and people will be like, oh well, how can Blizzard do this? I think this is a reaction to the community saying that they want. So to be to be clear, the patch that people want is the hundred armor Brigitte new Hanzo patch. That's the patch that people want. That's the one that everybody's been been complaining about. And it sounds like that's the one that Blizzard's trying to deliver. It's just a matter of how can they actually create? I think a server build. Or whether whether it's even a good idea to put that patch on there because there hasn't been a lot of experimentation with with the new Hanzo. And I know a lot of fans will say, Oh, well, why don't you you know, you leave all this stuff on PTR? The problem from Blizzard's end, I know from talking to them, is that no one plays on PTR. And they ask professional players to come and play on PTR, but the pro yes. players don't want to play on PTR because it's different than the what they have to practice in Overwatch League. So they can't get Blizzard can't get valuable data because the pros can't sacrifice practice time to go to PTR to to test it. So then it goes on live, and that's where they actually get the data from, and that's where they make these adjustments. Now, a lot, I will I will say I think a lot of the live stuff has been way over tuned, and I think Blizzard is still getting a hang of balancing this game in a way that is good at the professional level, and that's something that takes time for every developer to to understand how to do. But it hasn't been great, so. Uh, now, the the other side of this coin, too, is that sometimes because of the five week, the five week long stages where we don't get patches, we got stuck with the really bad Mercy meta in stage one. But we skipped the really bad Sombra meta that Gods had to play in, <laughs> in Contenders. So what is your experience been, Gods? Because you've you've mostly been on like the bleeding edge of these patches. You get them much faster, but you also got more problems before the Sombra nerf. Uh, I think there's a lot to say about the the differences in patches for uh, Overwatch League and Contenders and Live, which is sometimes three different things, right? Um, I don't think it's really just one big reason on why we need to go one way or the other as far as having both Contenders and Overwatch League and Live all be the same or whatnot. I think it's a lot of little things that go into it. Um, as far as like the patches that I've had to play, I think there was a lot of data for Sombra um, being buffed from kind of niche to being like 80 to 100 percent pick rate, uh, 80 to 99 percent pick rate in contender scrims on PTR when it was being tested, because um, contenders teams do play a lot of PTR. Right now, contenders teams play PTR to scrim, and so there is a lot of data on certain things that are just blatantly, obviously overpowered, um, like Sombra was. And I think if Sombra had gone through to to Overwatch League, there would have been a lot of uh, uproar because I think her potential was not actually met in contenders and i think she was definitely s plus tier viable in every, almost every situation um right after her buff so i think as far as like what patch overwatch league should play on i definitely feel like blizzard just needs to have a softer hand for reworking and buffing and nerfing heroes so that if a hero is buffed or nerfed the patch can go through and be played on everything at once so there's no disconnect for the average player that plays quick play a couple hours a day and someone who's super hardcore and knows every buff and nerf of every patch that is being played. I think there definitely needs to be no disconnect. And I think it's kind of on Blizzard to be able to be really soft and, you know, buff and nerf numbers instead of harshly reworking a hero like Mercy from being kind of meh to being obviously extremely overpowered in stage one. So what do you think about the, the creation of new heroes, too? Because I saw Brigitte before she was released to the PTR publicly, and I was super concerned about the like permanent 150 armor that she was giving to people. Um, 
because one of my problems with Mercy in stage one was that it allowed worse teams to win team fights and win games because the fact that one even a bad team with res could still outplay a good team without res uh was to me like a major problem in the game because of the the two instant reses that you were going to or the uh, Valkyrie rather the two instant reses you were going to get and the huge advantage that, that ults created and I guess one of my concerns with Brigitte was that because you can pop this this rally ultimate before going into the fight and end up with an additional 150 extra armor in HP that's just stuck on every single hero that's coming into the fight, it gives you a massive advantage, like an even more massive advantage than you would normally get with a normal ult. Um, it seems like we're going to get the patch that doesn't have that, of, like it'll be 100 armor, which is still probably too much, but as a, as a hero, how do you think Brigitte is going to change the game, and what do you think about her introduction when it comes to balance philosophy? So when it comes to balancing new heroes that are put into the game, I think Overwatch is in a un really unique situation, because it's the only FPS that has well, the only popular esport FPS that has, you know, um, such a high mechanical ceiling, but also has heroes that you have to pick that are vastly different from one another. I think games, obviously, like League of Legends or like Dota, if a new hero is brought in that's overpowered or a niche hero is reworked into being S plus tier, it can just be banned as a first ban. Sure. Um, but <laughs> Overwatch obviously doesn't have that. And so it, you're kind of resorted to having to not have the hero be played in a stage. And I think you could do that if a new hero is, is released and not have it be played in, in the patch, but have every other um, sort of balance change go through. Obviously, that might have some issues, but um, I think it would be worth it in the long run. As far as Brigitte as a, as a specific hero, I think one of her biggest strengths is giving armor to heroes like Zenyatta and Zarya that have shields. Yep. And then the shields are, when you take damage, it does damage with the shields and not the armor that you have. So. The shields are in front of the armor in that way, so you end up keeping that 150 armor, or 100 now. Um, but as far as Vegeta, I think I think they're going in the right direction. I think there are a few smaller changes. I think there's a lot of sort of horizontal changes you can make to her that would make her fit into the game a lot better, that wouldn't shake up too many things, and that would make her feel viable without kind of dictating the meta. Um, you know, something like, you know, reducing the max armor from her ult, but maybe giving it, having the armor per second be higher during her ult so it's used for fighting more, and maybe, you know, or maybe have it give the rest of her teammates the speed boost during her ult, you know, something like that. Some side grades instead of giving it a, a direct nerf, because I feel like she is going to be kind of pigeonholed, just like Zarya is, into these compositions where she's too hard to play with dive because she's too slow and vulnerable. And she's too good not to have in a lot of tank comps. And so I guess you just, when you're releasing new heroes, you want to have them not feel like they're, you want to, you want them to feel like they're filling a role, but not be too pigeonholed into certain comps, I guess. I think that's, that's really hard for Blizzard to do, but they're headed in the right direction with Brigitte, I think, as far as her as an individual. Just kind of mad that no one knows, though. Like, the, it is two days until the first match is. So I mean, I, think, feel, I have a feeling we'll know by today. I have, I have a feeling we will know today. Yeah, I, I think I, I think probably it'll happen probably before this this episode even comes out. Um, but again, this I think this is in in a way it's a good sign because it does mean that they're trying to. Uh, this is a, a step towards more close alignment with the actual uh, community desires and having the live patch and the uh, the the professional patch mesh up better. So. At least they're they're listening and trying to make it happen. If I may, I would say also just on this note that Hanzo is probably the most overpowered DPS that we've ever had, besides McCree and Widow in their prime. I think the new Hanzo is on par with Valkyrie and it's at its height. Um, the Valkyrie Mercy. So I, I think, think if it, that was probably part of the reason why they didn't want to put Hanzo in the new Hanzo in this in this patch. For the they, need to, they need to take it out of competitive then. Like they need to do something to where lie like the live server has to be the outpatch. Like in order for like Overwatch League to sustain itself and to grow, in my opinion, I think that just has to be how it is. I think every player acknowledges the fact that Hanzo was broken, but every player also acknowledges the fact that in order for 
the viewership to grow for the for their practice to line up with like their their free time like it just has to be a thing i don't know it's just that's just how people feel that's how everyone in overwatch league feels we just want it all to align so at the moment in in this case then what you scrim on is separate from what you play when you're just playing like uh, matchmaking yes. basically yeah and it, that is somewhat troublesome I mean that's how it that's how it is in in like a lot of esports. That's how it was in League of Legends too, because they would delay the new patches by about two weeks just to make sure there aren't any bugs because you don't want it breaking sure. the game, which I think is reasonable. But if 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 that's the case, the and you need this like two week grace period, then the suggestion I think would be for <coughs> Overwatch League season two to create two week breaks between stages so you have a longer break between stages for them to patch make sure that everything's going well and then implement it at the start of the next stage so if you need a more grace period then just build it into the league structure to make sure that everything is aligned and running smoothly i think that's probably just a good idea just for the people who play in the overwatch league anyway i mean the amount of time so far where there's been some korean players who just mysteriously have to like return to the fucking <laughs> I mind to go back home to like recharge for two weeks and come back. Like, it's happened too many times, Monty. You know, so we never get the reasons why. Just like, oh, he needed to return to his planet. Like, sounds. <laughs> Overwatch League is very, very draining. I think like everyone feels exhausted in Overwatch League right now. Here's some well, good I, news. I, though, I do think that, I, regardless of whether I, I do think that there's going to be more breaks next year, just based on conversations that I've heard, and it's it's I'm not sure if it'll happen between every stage, but there's there's been talks of like obviously increasing breaks in the middle of the season between stage two and three between every stage, but I think it's generally acknowledged that more breaks are going to be necessary. There is some good yeah. news though, Monty. Do you know what today is? Monday the 14th. Do you know what the significance of that day is, Monty? No. <laughs> today is Flower's 18th birthday. Oh, very nice. I saw that on Twitter earlier. <laughs> so the question is this, though. If you're the team that already wins all the stages anyway, loses <laughs> like one game a stage, and is considered almost unbeatable, do you actually insert Flower into the lineup? What so I, what what is God's thing from having to play against Flower on NYXL two in contenders? Uh, I think Flower has always been obviously always been an amazing player. As far as his impact on what he impact he would have on the Overwatch League team of NYXL, uh, I think that would depend on like what the other DPS players bring to the table besides mechanical skill. Obviously, there's a lot of intangibles that DPS players bring to their teams, and maybe Flower will fill that for them. But obviously, when NYXL is so good already, it's hard to justify them replacing anyone. Because that's the problem, isn't it? It's like, who do you take out to put him in? I mean, they already don't get to play Pine except every now and then. So who did they put him in? I mean, Sabiel B just carried the whole stage final. So Sabiel B can't be replaced. He's like a big part of their calling from as far as I understand. So does, he go in, does he go in Liberal's spots? Liberal's got pretty good Liberal's stats in the league. Got top better players. too, I, I think, over, compared to what he was in Meta Athena. He's actually improved quite a bit from being in Overwatch League. We're seeing him play heroes he never played before. I'm not sure actually how much Flower is going to improve New York. Yeah. If he goes there, I mean, I feel like he would be more valuable to other teams. I think so too. Definitely would be. This is where the Soul Dynasty need to make a baller move. Over there. <laughs> they have Fleta though. I feel like they already have that that like flexible DPS player. I think if I was Flower too, I think I wouldn't want to go to New York. Like I think if I'm like a power player. And I think, and I could refer to myself as Flower God. I think I'd want to go to a team that's not the best team and try to make them better, and also make sure that I have a starting spot all the time. So who would that? Who would fit the bill for that then, Kai Kai? I mean, it, how do Korean teams? I don't know because I don't know. Like some Koreans want to just be on Korean teams, and some don't care. So, I mean, there's a lot of Western teams you could go to to help. Although then he would have to learn English or whatever. And then Korean teams, I think he could. I think he could help Spitfire if if 
Birdering is Birdering injuries, doesn't things. come back. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. It's like he's definitely the best fit for Spitfire if Birdering is not going to be an active player. Otherwise, I don't even think any of the Korean teams need him. Because if Birdering comes back and then Flood is there, his skills are not quite as useful to either of those teams. I mean, I maybe they'll even be a fourth Korean team next next season too. So Certainly possible. I, I would say probably, you know, if you're going to expand, you'd have at least one more all Korean yeah. team. And he could just be like the 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 pushing figure of that team, so Flower to Dallas. Uh <laughs> why not? <laughs> I mean gladiators could certainly with use him. Flower? Uh, Houston, I don't I don't think Houston would be a good team for him. I think. I haven't really thought about it, but he has too much individual skill. Doesn't fit with your, <laughs> your current mold of uh, prioritizing yeah. teamwork over everything else, right? And he probably doesn't want to play with our hunt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just he, think he that, actually knows him. <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's very clear by now that Houston's biggest uh, missing key is like a consistent tracer player. So, and I, as far as I know, Flower doesn't want to be a one trick tracer player. So. Wait, is this somebody on Houston admitting that the problem is that you have a you don't have a good tracer player? I like you joining this team. Now we actually have real, <laughs> real acknowledgement of problems. <laughs> um, I I actually think that like when I came to Houston, I I was very like, I guess for lack of a better word, I was annoyed by the fact that like they were switching tracers between three different players. But then like I just kind of realized that Jake. Wait, if you tell Jake what to do a lot, like I think he can actually perform pretty well. So before every match, I would kind of go go over with Jake like all the little things, like exactly how we should play, like what play style we should try to play. And I think that like his performance improved a lot from that. Uh, I, I think he just needs guidance, but I think long term, I don't even think Jake wants to be like a, the tracer player. I, I, I don't know. Tracer seems to like require like this personality of like thinking that you're like a god and I don't know it's so weird so well it's also we'll really hard to compete it's really hard to compete with tracers that only play tracer as someone who doesn't only play tracer right for Jake yeah. it's got to be hard it's definitely hard for Jake and I actually think that he's done well like considering how little he's played tracer I think people like give him a lot of shit that he doesn't really deserve but I, I will say over stage three Statistically, none of your tracers improved on an individual level, but the team played around the tracer better, which I think was the real improvement there is that you guys figured out how to make tracer work without having an ace tracer player, which was impressive in its own way. I'm not sure that's like, obviously it would be better just to have a tracer player, but I, I have been impressed by Houston's ability to figure out how to replace individual skill with teamwork and still be a good team. Um, and also, you're coming up on a patch where... You, you're, you guys should be uniquely qualified for this patch that is coming up to perform very well in Overwatch League. I mean, that all depends. Like, it depends on if it's the Hanzo patch or whatever. Like, it seems like you the, have a good Hanzo player. You have Lingzer. Yeah, I mean, if it's the Hanzo patch, I think it's better for us. I mean, so it might sound biased if I say I want the Hanzo patch, but I think that it's, I don't know, whatever. But the, and I think you're still going to see Tracer if it's still a 1.22, like sometimes, not all the time, but I still think you're going to see it sometimes. I, okay, it seems like there's so many... It is, regardless of which patch, it is a better patch. Now, how much better? We can debate. It is a better patch for the Houston Outlaws. Can we agree on that? It's actually hard to say. It's hard to say because, <laughs> because I'll tell you, I'll tell you why it's hard to say. Because I think... In my opinion, at first glance, we've only scrimmed one day, and even before this day, this is how I feel. I think that for this patch, 1.22, I think that a very key thing will having like a really good DPS player that can play a really, really good Zarya. I think that'll be very key in this patch, at first glance. So, as far as I'm aware, I don't think any of the DPS players on Outlaws uh, play Zarya, at least like a lot, to where they're like a power Zarya, but... I don't know. We'll see. We'll have to figure it all out. Uh, I'm going straight from here to scrims later, so we're going to get right back into it and try to figure it out. So, gods, which of the Overwatch League teams do you think are going to be particularly good or bad? Like, who's going to be the biggest movers on this patch? Uh, I think the most impacted team would probably be Houston. Um, 
Houston and maybe Mayhem. I do have. I do think that um, you're wrong when you, uh, Monty, when you said that Houston doesn't have or that that they have to compensate for mechanical skill with teamwork because I do think that the new patch is is super um, tank dependent, but it's also really dependent on having strong projectile players and flexible DPS players. So not having a tracer one trick in the new patch is actually a good thing, especially if it's one of your core players. So being able to play things like uh, you know, Hanzo Junkrat, Hanzo Widow, Junkrat oh, I mean, I Widow, totally agree with you on stuff that. like that. Yeah, and having your tanks be able to be, uh, you know, really solid and a big part of your team is is really important. I think, I think it would actually, <laughs> I think it would help Houston Outlaws a lot. Um, I think it's going to help Dallas a lot, to be honest. I don't know about that. I, I would. I be, mean, I would, okay. I'd Ooh, Some people can say Dallas is so work, far man. gone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, think about the same way. Effects in Korea. Okay. You, like you said, it's not a tracer patch. I also think that it favors. Well, he's a good Zarya player too, which could help them. But if he so is Siegel. Here. And Siegel is a flexible player that can can do that. Is Siegel as good as Zarya's effect is? I mean, communication wise, he's obviously a lot better. In terms of like, I'm gonna go in and shit on your old team. Maybe Effects got the edge on him, but Siegel is still good at it. I also think that Mickey is is better. Like Mickey's playstyle for Bridget is probably going to be better than what it was as Diva. Uh, I think that um, Dallas also excels in, in slow team ball, team, like team death ball comps. I think that sure. Reinhardt is better than Winston for that team. I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, viability for Ana coming back, which is good for for the Dallas supports. I think that. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I, I think, think Dallas's like, Dallas's main issue moving into the new patch would be that their DPS players that they've been playing, like Effect Acam, um, have kind of been really focused on hit scan, I guess. And besides Siegel, they don't have anyone else that's really good at like having a large hero pool all at once. I think they've been pretty specialized for the most part, at least from what we've seen in Overwatch League. So. Even you know Taimu, who's been who's played a lot of different roles, he's not really ever excelled at uh, like Genji and, and projectile roles. So I would say they would have a lot of issues with flexibility unless they added someone who's you know good at playing all the weird DPS as well, and not just the ones that have been historically really popular, like Genji and Tracer and whatnot. No, and they might even exist. do like they might even do like Coco, Zarya, OGE, Ryan, and then like. Uh, Siegel as the flex DPS. I mean, you never really know. But I do think that as far, I think that this patch, especially if they had effect, but even so now, I think that this patch is probably the best patch for Dallas at, out of all four stages, I think. But I do think they need to get out of this mindset of like, oh, we're just playing for fun before they can actually like win. I guess. Obviously, this is just some sort of Full Metal Alchemist scenario where they had to sacrifice something important to themselves. <laughs> In an exchange, they got a patch that was unacceptable, but they could plan. So it was a he they had to pay a hefty price money, but it was worth it. It's well, we'll see it. if it was worth it. <laughs> so why did you say Florida Mayhem? Wasn't that the other team you said, Gods? Yeah, just because Tivik on Hanzo's... I remember playing against it and it was really annoying. So I think I have a lot of confidence in his Hanzo. Um, other than that, eh. okay. One team I wanted to ask you about is the San Francisco Shock because obviously last stage was when they were finally able to get all these young players in. They added the new players, Moth Architect. I saw actually that there's a news where they've gotten one of the coaches from Boston Uprising, Krusty, to become their new head coach. And then they've got another Korean coach in. So. What do you think of, of Shock? What should we expect from them? I think Shock's going to be good. I think that Krusty was a very large factor in Boston's success. I think that like Hux, Hux's uh, organization of the team and like how it was structured is was definitely like crucial and Huck did an amazing job, but I think that Krusty also his role was like vital in that team. So I think that you're going to see maybe a slight hit from Boston. I'm so why would they why would good. they get rid of him? Because Hawk was like, it was all me. <laughs> we do it. We, all we need's me, sir. I mean, I think it's safe to say that they didn't get rid of him. Okay. But. 
So uh, came in with that long paper. I mean, I, I don't have all the details. Don't take this as like leaks, but <laughs> I, I'm i pretty sure. It's just speculation, yeah. If I'm crusty, if I'm crusty, I could imagine getting tons of offers from other teams because of Boston's success. I could imagine having the choice to go anywhere I want. And also, you get yet another chance to prove yourself by pulling a team from from rags to riches, basically. I mean, it makes it makes all the sense in the world. I highly doubt that someone is going to take like a coach at Krusty's level, who's probably the best coach in Overwatch League, and just be like, "Okay, you're gone. Bye." Why is that your whole thing in in when you're modeling these scenarios that the person has to go to like a bad team and they're like just by the power of themselves they raise them up? And <laughs> they're actually good. That person's actually good. I mean, co- coaches, coaches in Overwatch League, and as far as like all of Overwatch, yeah. they get blamed for everything that's wrong, and they never get credit for it, anything that's good. So there's like a lot, there's yes. a big part of coaching to have to like prove yourself right now, and and I think that like going into season two, I think it, like I think that coaches' salaries will definitely go up in season two, and I think that it's very important for coaches to prove themselves in some way right now, and I think that Krusty is making a good decision like by doing what he's doing. So why do you say that Krusty, you think Krusty is the best coach in Overwatch League? I've had a lot of talks with him uh, personally. Uh, and I also like he from heard from players like from Shock and 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 Boston. I've heard players that worked with him and OGE even worked with him. And I've heard like his style for things, how he does things. And I like I I completely agree with like his style, like everything that he does. And I know that like I know that he's smart. Like he basically like the way that he taught Boston dive comp. It's like <laughs> it was like science. Like they were the best dive team. I think I even said this back in stage one. Like they just had like the best understanding of it. Like how to change from slow to fast and how to position themselves. Like how to react off each other. Like their their synergy was just it's it's crazy. And I think that like a big part of that can be attributed to Krusty. I mean, he's taking teams from the past in Korea and then making them go- gone from like tier three to like basically tier one. I mean, I, I think his track record track record is amazing. I think that if you talk to him one on one, you can realize that his game knowledge is amazing. I think that his ability to work with players one on one is 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 he's very fast. He's very like he is very attentive to detail. Like I don't know, I can't speak enough praises of Crest. I think he's the best coach in Overwatch League. I also think that New York coaches are very good too. So I know there's going to be people like, no, New York coaches are better. But I think Krusty, <laughs> as one coach, he is the best coach. I mean, he certainly had less talent to start out with. The The core of LW was always known to have a very high skill ceiling and be a, a top tier team that hadn't quite lived up to the mark, which I do credit New York's coaches with helping. But it, I, I mean, do think it's I think New York coaches are very good. Case. Yeah. What do you think of Seoul Dynasty's coaches? I actually really like uh, the GC Busan coach. They got Hokuri or whatever. Okay. I think that he's very, very like good, especially in like his counter strategies. I just think that Seoul Dynasty's problem is that they have too many like head coaches that clash with each other. Probably. I mean, I don't know, but I'm assuming that like going even just like me and Tyrone, it's just like it's. I can tell that like if there was like five head coaches on a team, you're gonna have problems. <laughs> It does seem a bit redundant to have multiple head coaches. Like, did, uh, is this just something they picked up? It's like, I don't think you know what that word means. Like, how can we all be the head coach? Like, that's having like five CEOs or something. Like, logically, there can only be one, can't there? Who's, is someone like the superior head coach or something? Like, how does that work? I mean, I think that, I think there is by, by title, but right, by so mindset, there is some it's system. completely different. Yeah. It's not like one of the coaches comes in like, right, guys, I've got the plan for you. What do you mean? The other guy came in and told us it all 10 minutes ago. Fuck. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is the, oh, uh, when you said that though, the, the, the coaching aspect, so you don't think there's a, is there not a player problem with Dynasty that have got the right pieces? Hmm. I think that Munchkin's good, Flood is good. I mean, I think their players are all good. And I think that that Reed Jahong change on tank, it actually like, surprisingly, it it's done, seems to have done wonders for them. I don't know. They seem so much better now. Uh, they have the players. I mean, I think that they could definitely like replace some players and get better options. But I, I maybe they're having the same problem as Dallas. I don't know. 
it's so hard to tell. You really don't know the problems of a team unless you're in the team or you know. Like that's one thing I've learned is that you never know what a team is like until you're in that team. And no one can really like say anything about it. What do you think, Gods? What do you think of the Dallas, uh, the Dynasty team, rather? Uh, well, they're one of my favorite teams uh, historically, just because I obviously have played against them and been kind of watching them and their journey through all the apexes and whatnot. Uh, Miro, Toby, and uh, Jay Hong are some of my favorite players to watch. Period. So it is kind of sad for me and kind of hard for me to watch them fail. Um, but as far as like any insight i don't really have much but obviously um those players are kind of they do have some similarities with the dallas field players and that they were champions and kind of regarded as some of the best players in the world for a long time so you know you can never know what kind of effect that has on someone's mentality but i do think that soul dynasty has the players they just have to figure out what the key to success is for their team so monty when kai kai referenced it there where they did, made the move to put jay hong on tank basically like it's just it looked as though he wasn't actually that good but obviously he wasn't i mean mechanically he's comms, not a right? great winston um, they wanted the yeah. leadership though presumably and also i think he just hero was having this problem where he would like jump in he would use his jump like his leap ability to go in and then he would just be there by himself and have no way to escape and have no support and just die so I think his decision making was very poor, even though he was getting more value out of Primal Rages and the, the aspects of Winston's kit that actually required you to have good mechanics. But the, I think the price was is that he was just completely isolated from the rest of his team. So I think by having Jay Hong in, he's playing with the team better, but he's not having the same spectacular mechanical plays. But then you question, like, what is more important to this team? Is it more important that they have a great mechanically, you know, playmaking Winston, or is it more important that Fleta and Munchkin have the proper space to pop off? I would argue that the latter is more important because Fleta and Munchkin, even when Soul has been slumping, have both been performing at an individual level very well. So I think they made the right decision. I think that the team Winston is always going to be better. Like that, you'll notice that like when whenever a team looks disorganized, I see. Uh, I see like a lot of people throw blame around to like all kinds of people, but it's usually like a Winston with the Winstons that are good to me are the Winstons that are good about having the team revolve around them and the team move as like a unit around them, whether it's diving a target, whether it's just being on the same page, whether it's knowing that we're going to counter dive, whatever. And I think that Jay Hong is probably respected heavily by that team and he can make these calls and everyone's going to listen. And I think that's what works for them. I think for Miro, maybe he's lost his touch a little bit. I think historically his style has not been um, what it is right now. Um, I think historically he's played really well around high grounds and disengages and playing very safe to make space without dying. And lately it's kind of seemed like he's just going in and fully committing himself and not really necessarily having maybe the trust from his teammates to play around him making space and staying alive. I think. When I, I, I had a bit of a spout on main tank myself, and one of the people that I studied the most was Miro, and I kind of took his style and adapted it myself. And I think he's definitely kind of lost his touch, and maybe he just needs to get back to that um, that style that he played when he is considered one of the best Winstons in the world. I don't know. I think the problem could be the fact that he started to lose confidence. And like when you lose confidence as a tank, you lose a lot of the calling. Like, like I said, that's why it's so hard to know like what the true problems are unless you're a part of the team. Cause I think a lot about Winston, like once you learn how to do primal raging and like all the, that stuff, I think a lot of it comes down to what you can effectively communicate and how fast you can communicate it with your team. And then it's about having the team trust you and just like following up. And I can tell that like, there seems to be like a very good synergy between Munchkin and, and Jay Hong right now. Like even like between rounds, like you can see the way they look at each other, the way they high five each other. Like you can see that there's a good deal of respect between those two and like, and it shows in game. Like they're always on the same page as each other. It works. 
I forgot that was a thing that Americans are like obsessed with in sports, it's like high fiving each other as like a sign that like, I think okay, oh, okay I, I respect think, you. We're into this. <laughs> no, no, no. I th- I think it's so stupid. Like I feel like a lot of the 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 fist bumping between rounds is so like forced and it looks very like oh, silly well, to me. The sad thing is, mate, that actually it's all from Counter Strike. Yeah, sadly, <laughs> it's all it from just looks so stupid. Because unfortunately, obviously, after every round in Counter Strike, they always go to that player cam, and it just became a famous thing where like everyone does the fist bump, but it's gotten so bad now. It's like yeah. you know in the NBA where they do people have to high five the guy who's taking the free throw every time, even if he misses. I've never understood that one. Why are you high fiving him? He missed. They do it. They do the same in Counter Strike. Even if he leaves the round, you have to give the guy a fist bump. Like why am I giving him a fist bump? He just fucking costs us the round. You should have to earn yeah. that fist bump. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think you it's know, just stupid. At least make it a reward system. And if you don't do it right, they do something like cold shoulder or something, you know, or, or do that like Drake thing, like, <laughs> one hand up against the side of their face. Cold shoulder your teammate. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd run a bit more of a harsh team than some people. You know? <laughs> You're gonna tell your players not to fist bump someone if they feed. Why not? Or, yeah. Shit, isn't them, that it you know? looks stupid. You've got to fire them up. Like to barely win around or like to just get lucky or anything like that like there's so many unnecessary fist bumps you see and and especially in overwatch league i think it's i think it's ridiculous why why why, why did you get so mad about unnecessary fist bumps it's so well it's cringy to be fair though monty this i i can actually give you some an anecdote on this line because you know everyone gets by the way everyone in cs gets mad triggered by this as well you know people get mad triggered when you watch an esports event and you see all the like 14 year old kids dabbing in the crowd right you know everyone always just gets like mad annoyed even though it's just a crowd shot you know what they're supposed to do just sit there doing nothing that wouldn't be better but i have to say this is where i did learn like i think i have an insight to this because i agree dabbing looks mega cringy like especially if you're just a 15 year old kid and most of them don't even do like one dab you know they do like a like they just do like 15 in a row like super quick but i will say this because your good friend Sadakist really hates it when people dab. And even though we used to say the same thing, like, yeah, it's just stupid. Me and Henry as a joke, so Henry's his casting partner in CS, just for fun, we did it a couple of times, like on stream. And just because he kept saying, like, we stop fucking doing that. Why are you why are you dabbing on stream? You're encouraging him. I have to say it made it fun. Cause like knowing that he was getting so angry why I did it <laughs> made it become like I actually started getting into it. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. And as a result, it's just changed my whole perspective on it. So <laughs> this one's for you, this dab's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I guess I can't agree with you that making Zadikist angry is, in fact, fun. Yeah. All I'm getting from this conversation is that instead of fist bumping, teams team just dab between rounds. Yeah, instead of fist bumping. Not. That's all I'm getting from this conversation. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind like the whole pine dabbing thing. I think it's good, but it's like good, yeah. I think it's like showmanship at that point. I just think that the fist bumps are forced and it's cringy and it's not not necessarily needed or deserved. It's all right. What I'll do is I'll just I'll just forward to Team Four like all that all that footage of people who were in the Black Panthers and then those people who were in the Olympics when they did that fist in the air. And then when they find out that a fist was ever used in a political context, they'll be banned tomorrow. You won't even be allowed to make a closed hand in the Overwatch League when I'm done. All right, we probably should talk about that actually because it is getting I think somewhat ridiculous. Here's the thing, Monty. Okay, so I'll I'll set it up. So there's been a bunch of different news, but first of all, let's go with the apparel related one. Okay. So obviously Philadelphia Fusion's Academy team is called Fusion University. Good name. And as quite a clever, edgy take on it, they made their jerseys say FU, which by the way, <laughs> isn't actually even as blatant as some other things, you know, that, could, that technically could mean anything, you know, it's not, not even used that much nowadays. And apparently, right. I actually checked up on the Reddit thread on this. Apparently, what happened was Blizzard tried to claim something like they didn't give approval for this jersey, but then Kirby, the manager of Fusion, says that, coach rather, it says that actually they did submit it and it just, they just never got a reply or something. So regardless, let's be real. The real reason they banned it is because it said F you. Like that's yes. good. come on, it's no way it was like some sort of like oh I'm sorry the correct paperwork and subsection nine seven like there's no way it's because it says F you isn't it. It also doesn't just say FU. It says Fusion University yeah, right underneath exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. But I... Uh, I mean, by that logic, it actually says, fuck you, Fusion University, if you're bad <laughs> in it. So obviously they won't say that, will they? I mean, that would be unreasonable. <laughs> I, so I, I do understand, you know, I tweeted about this and I was like, I've literally worn like a Banff belt buckle because I have like a replica McCree belt buckle that, I, yes. that was like custom made for me. 
Um, and I've worn it on broadcast and obviously Banff is in the game. And I think people are mad, like over this specific issue, like I, I get why they, they didn't want the, the F U jerseys, which is sort of like the extreme end of things. But the problem is, is that people got mad about this because there were so many other things previously that were ridiculous yes. that even now the less yes. ridiculous things that like this are, are becoming, it's, ca- it's called QXC syndrome. Like, XQC, XQC I always get that one wrong. It's called XQC syndrome. What happens is when enough ridiculous shits happened in a row, just when the guy breathes, you're like, bad him for that. That's unacceptable. Was that toxic? Like at the end, it gets ridiculous, doesn't it? Where like he hasn't even done anything, but he's done yeah. anyway. So I think, I think like the the problem is 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 if this had just been an isolation, and the problem too is that people like to just point at Blizzard and say that Blizzard is like censoring all this stuff and whatever. But I think the issue is is that there's actually like as far as I can tell, there's no one person who is making all of these decisions. It's like a bunch of decisions that are being made very conservatively by like a lot of independent people that are adding up to what is, I think, to like, I, I hesitate to use the word censorship because that's not really it. It's just sort of like this repressive behavior code. <laughs> Wait a minute, Daddy. You 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 hesitate to use the term censorship about literally banning words from being used. (laughs) uh, Are you on message right now? What's going on? No, I I, like. I'm just saying it's it's not it's not like a political message that is being repressed, right? It's like an fu jersey, which is why I, I think censorship might be too strong of a word for it because it's not people being unable to express reasonable thoughts. It's like a jersey that says fu. Um. So I, it is like censorship, I guess, but it's not, I wouldn't say that anybody's individual like ability to express themselves is necessarily being But this does tie out. into another story, though, that was similar, which is that people discovered that if you're in the contenders Twitch chat, you can't say LMAO, so laughing my ass off, one of my favorites. It's, it's very underused, but I feel like it's a classic because <laughs> it just sounds awesome, doesn't it? Laughing my ass off. Then there was also, you're not allowed to say sucks. I mean... <laughs> I guess or if you climax, really want to force that. climax, which is literally climax is the name of one. a Korean contenders yeah. player, so th- it, it, it is ridiculous. Like, I don't understand why climax needs to be banned in the chat when, even if it wasn't a player's ID and it is a perfectly appropriate player ID, why does that need to? Also, that not- was never part of esports fan culture. It was never like, haha, oh my climax, oh shit, like <laughs> that was never even a thing anyone said. Like, why are you preemptively bad and shit? Going back to the uh, jersey thing, though, was it better for the broadcast to have them in black shirts? Like, did that actually look better than to have a jersey that said "FU" on it? Because to me, I think that looks very, very bad. I, I that's the decision that they that they made. I mean, I would, it literally like when it came out in black shirts, it looks like, like, it just I don't know. It just. Gave me like See, very bad vibes. My, my, my I, they never thought it that... through. I would have just gone topless. Go, okay, I can't wear the jersey. Fuck it. There we go. <laughs> what do you want? I've, it's my jersey. Well, there we go. That my protest. It's a, it's a naked protest. Yeah, I I think the jersey was fine. By the way, like if it had just said "F you," then I would have been like, okay, maybe not. But it did say Fusion University underneath, and like Thorin said. At the you know if you read it it says fuck you fusion university exactly it doesn't even make sense does it <laughs> so if anything it's like making fun of fusion university so i thought it was perfectly fine and i do appreciate that like the the gm of the fusion tucker and everybody at fusion itself was coming out sort of in protest of all of this they were you know they seemed pretty frustrated with the whole situation But I just I think that this is just it it has gotten a little bit ridiculous. And I think what Blizzard needs to do is sit down and collectively reevaluate because what is appropriate, what isn't. Because like I said, I think it's been like a bunch of I think it's been a bunch of like other like people independently making these decisions and not a unified message because the whole Pepe banning thing was ridiculous. Like, come on. Who cares about that? That's it's it's just it's so silly. It's the way they banned all variants of it as well. <laughs> did you see my meme though, Monty? This did allow me to get a glorious meme off because the thing is, I don't actually like to use like the most memes because by the time you hear about them, they've already been like just overused to death by every single person on the internet. But 
this did give me an opportunity. You know that meme everyone's doing at the moment, which is from that anime from like the 90s in Japan, where it's like, is this a pigeon? And then it's a butterfly. You know, this is the one that everyone's using at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's a guy coming out of a hospital and he goes, is this a pigeon? And it's obviously a butterfly, right? So the the implication is he doesn't know what it is. So the meme, that's a very popular meme at the moment, especially in politics. So I just made it where the guy's face was the Blizzard Entertainment logo. And then I made the butterfly <laughs> just said esports fan culture. And then the line at the bottom was him just saying, is this alt-right bigotry? <laughs> that was I mean, his question. <laughs> I feel like that summed the, the situation up. Because the answer is no, but okay. You know, maybe I, you need to get educated. I think that, I th- yeah, I think that it is ridiculous the way they've taken some of this stuff. But it, I just don't understand why they don't do the elegant solution to it. So it's like, I, I suggested when we were talking about like the use of try hard in the, in the owl stream when the XQC stuff came up. And yeah. I said, why not just have like use emotes of all of the people on the camera, like all of the casters and talent and everybody. That way they they you encourage people to spam that instead of try yes. hard, right? Why don't they just do that? It's like they don't they don't look for the elegant solution to the problem. They don't try and change the culture in a in like a positive way or a way that that bill like adds something additional for people to have fun with. They just take away what they're having fun with and then replace it with nothing. Also, now people can't, in theory, in that chat type, Monty sucks. Just gets banned. <laughs> I know, that's Why, really that fair. Yeah. It's not. No, I think people Were should be involved with this censorship. I, What's going on here? I mean, I, I, as far as sucking goes, I have voluntarily on many occasions yes. proclaimed that I am a Korean fellatio enthusiast. Absolutely, so really, yeah. they're just taking away part of my, my <laughs> online. Exactly. Hurting your brand. <laughs> You're compromising your image and who you've become. And hard fought image at like that. You put in the hours. So I think I think some of the stuff is like, I mean, who wants to like? Pepe sort of a tired meme at this point anyway. And like, I don't really give a fuck if like Pepe exists in in the Twitch chat of Owl. But it just like gives give people something else. Like if you if you if you want to encourage behavior, then just give them something to work with, as opposed to just like taking away what people enjoy and just not giving them anything in return. Also, I'm gonna go the other way on this one. I'm actually gonna use the classic tired excuse that people always give that you shouldn't ban certain things and you know what the old line used to be because then the terrorists have won all that has to happen now is isis just has to start using pog champ everywhere and then now that's going to get banned as well isn't it they could ruin all of western fan well, culture but that's, that's so the, easy that's the stupid thing about this whole overwatch league is that i know there's probably some depths of the internet there's like some buried the uh, forum like like there's some buried part of 4chan that once they see that Blizzard they can is just like banning exactly memes they love that, trolling shit like that yeah they, so what they'll do is they'll just turn everything into yes. like a Nazi meme right yeah. they will see what you're encouraging people to do is to see which memes are popular in Overwatch League and then the trolls will attempt to ruin that meme with like by putting swastikas all over it or whatever and then forcing Blizzard to respond because what happens the cycle the cycle that happens is like. The memes start, okay? Then the trolls turn these memes into something that's like hateful or inappropriate. Yes. And then Kotaku writes an article about how this meme is actually yep. hateful or inappropriate yep. because the trolls have been trying to bait Kotaku or like another like shitty journalist into recognizing that these memes are somehow hateful. Yep. And then the meme turns and then they then they force the company yep. to to change it. It's ridiculous. And then, and then, and then a new meme comes as along. As long as you acknowledge yes. this. It's called the meme outrage treadmill. <laughs> then a new meme comes along, then that one gets co-opted by 4chan or Ilbay <laughs> or whoever. I mean, it affects probably on fucking Ilbay right now, posting Pepe oh, everywhere he can. Oh boy, oh boy. you just made all the sure, and To make bad. sure he never comes back to the Dallas... <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes. I'll post Pepe, <laughs> LMAO, Sucks, Climax, wherever it takes. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you guys think about being in the middle of this? Can you even say anything? I think it's stupid. I mean, I don't know if I can say anything or not, but I'm going to say that it's stupid. And I think that like, kind of like what you were saying, I mean, like, in my opinion, taking it away is just like, is bad because it just like, it doesn't really solve anything. And then at the same time, I mean, like, it's better if like they make their own culture, kind of like what you're saying, and just like their own memes, badges, icons, whatever the fuck they're called. 
and then rather than like using other people's stuff anyway because people will always find a way to to like spin stuff or i don't know i think it's stupid i don't even use twitch emotes anyway though so so he's not on board with any of it monty fist unnecessary fist bumps twitch emotes <laughs> he's not down he's with just it a purist. I mean, yeah. when, whenever whenever timo or xqc or like whenever they do the little twitch like kappa pog champ stuff i just think it's so stupid anyway like I'll never be able to handle that. That guy's real name is Timor. It's just yeah. unreal. <laughs> That'll never get old for me. Just literally the, the worst champ of all time in any mobile <laughs> ever created. It's pure cancer because it does nothing or it's just absolute ass. That just ruins the whole game. The thing is, there's so many people in Dallas that actually that walk fits. around saying, Pog champs, Pog champ, Poggers. Like it's just like normal everyday speak for them. I'm glad you got out of there, mate. That's just that is unacceptable. You know, no one has to work under those conditions. People in real life saying pog chop. That's even more ridiculous. <laughs> so the I guess I guess the main thing is like I don't know understand what the goal, the Blizzard's goal with this is. So it's like, okay, so they get they get rid of Pepe because they see it as some sort of like hateful also hateful Monty, theme. let's but be the, real the is, you are essentially challenging everyone on the internet to find ways to use the remaining exactly. emotes and all combinations of english language words to say offensive things now, exactly. now they're going to do it on purpose exactly. aren't they so you're encouraging it but the thing is is like so pepe pepe is used let's say there's a there's a sign in the overwatch league audience that has pepe who is anyone actually turning off the stream because they see a pepe that's my question like who is stopping watching Overwatch League because Pepe is in it? I want to know how many people were actually offended by it in the first place. I don't think well, anybody I'll was tell offended you, by it. No, it's part of the culture. It's, will, the thing is, is that the only logical explanation is that they are afraid that a mainstream news outlet is going to pick this up and be like, did you know that the alt-right... The, the Pepe, the symbol of the alt right, is part of Overwatch League. They're they're like afraid of like CNN doing that. That, or that something. is what happened. Oh, wasn't, don't you think that CNN. if that did happen, there would be so much like so many people within esports like or whatever to come defend Blizzard, and that that'd be better. For yeah, but nobody Blizzard. sees that. Like that's the thing is that it'll be CNN broadcasting this to like everybody, and no one's ever going to see the other side of that argument. Okay. Yeah, the problem so, like, with that is normal people. You, you can't get any response. Like here's the thing: I can actually tell you, Monty, because I remember where the genesis of this was. The person who wrote that hit piece that said me and Richard shouldn't be allowed to represent esports went to the Overwatch League for week one and they saw that sign and did a tweet that was like why is there a Pepe thing in the crowd and then that's what people picked up on because this person had done some journalism for like PC Games N or whatever that website was called and this is where it spiraled out from there and other people brought it up now there was no actual proper outrage like as you say they didn't go to CNN or whatever but the problem is I can tell you me and Richard have done these sorts of like sort of explanations of why these things are a problem. Because, for example, there was just an event in CS in Sydney and someone wrote an article about the event and then just crammed into the middle of it a bunch of weird stuff about how, like, you know, esports, like, keeps women inside tournaments and doesn't let them compete. You know, like, a bunch of, like, actually factually inaccurate nonsense. I read like that I, article, yeah. You know, it was but bad. here's the problem. <sighs> so the person who wrote that article had, like, maybe 3K Twitter followers didn't matter how many esports people messaged this person a whole bunch of known people like said this is totally inaccurate they never responded there was never any retraction from the guardian that's the problem i feel like i agree with you in a way unfortunately if this stuff breaks out into the mainstream you can't really combat it from within a small subculture you know so unfortunately yeah. you are at their mercy to some degree and sadly blizzard is definitely not taking the approach of being like we do not agree with you they just sort of seemingly acquiesce to them that's at least the way it seems publicly so they put themselves in a bad spot in that sense i think well and there's no winning either because like i said the trolls will now find ways to ruin other things and yeah. you know put them on the spot and they can't let themselves be dictated to by people who are just getting outraged by all this stuff because otherwise you just have nothing left you know eventually 
So I don't know. It's I think it's a it's a tough situation, and I understand why fans are mad, and I understand I understand too. Like my question was, who's going to turn off the stream because they saw Pepe? Like who's not watching? But uh, my personal belief is that people literally will not watch Overwatch League because they see it as watered down or censored or something like that. In fact, I think they're losing more viewers by by having these actions. Oh, I would I would bet. Here's the thing, right? I I'm like Kai Kai. Like I don't give a fuck about like Twitch emotes or whatever. If I watch the stream, I don't ever go in. The chat but i will say one of the big things that happened in counter-strike is a couple of seasons ago one of the online leagues it was the esl pro league one they switched their broadcaster from twitch to youtube they got a broadcast rights deal and they got paid a lot for it and the main complaint people had a lot of people complained about this was that they couldn't use the twitch emotes that really is what people were mad about like i thought they were joking at first like you know you can still just watch the game and they were like i want to spam pog champ when something happens like, it's like ah, maybe i misunderstood this whole experience <laughs> it's like at this point there's going to be one of those things like speak and spell for kids but we're just fucking twitch emotes on or something like there you go son what do you type when i do something crazy pog champ that's right poggers <laughs> i don't Should think we talk about actual overwatch league <laughs> do you have a final thought here, is, i don't think blizzard's too concerned with who's going to turn off the stream when they see a pepe i think they're more concerned with People, you know, in order to grow esports, they have to move outside of esports and get people from different avenues and different parts sure. of the entertainment industry and sports industry. And so I think what they're more worried about is, um, you know, a, a CNN, you know, whatever, some news facet would, you know, writing a hit or whatever. That wouldn't affect the people within the culture already, but it would yes. affect all the people outside of it. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to just stop that from happening than it is to repair that once it's already oh, happened. I I think you're I think you're absolutely right and I think there is some value to that but the problem is is that if you can't you have to choose your battles and it's like Blizzard is picking every battle they're simultaneously banning Fusion University the FU jersey while dealing with Pepe while making sure you can't type LMAO and Climax in their chat okay like well I, I agree your battles, with you you know like you pick your battles I mean, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, things like memes like Pepe and whatever can be, they're, they're free to access for anyone and they're used by everyone. And so it's not like you can just, you know, it's not fair to take one usage of it that's bad and say that's what it's used for when it's used for such a wide variety of things. And so obviously, I don't find it to be that necessary to get rid of it, but I do understand why they did, I guess. And I think it's important to understand why they did and not just sure. sort of, you know. The only thing is, though, I mean, I don't want to break the Overwatch League by letting everyone in on this life hack, but if they ban a word, you know you can just type all the letters of the word but put, like, asterisks between it. And if they do that, <laughs> put hyphens between it. And if they do that, put an underscore between it. You can, get, you can say any words you want. I've just told you the hack. There you go. You're around it. So now, unless numbers. they're going to take out all fucking, yeah, non-character, non-character, non whatever they're called, <laughs> Then they fucked out, they so. I've, well, I I I, uh, I personally look forward to the you know the the new articles on the alt right asterisk that's going to be. It'll happen because they'll claim it was like some sort of star, you know, like oh, is this anti-Semitism? What is this? Ah, oh, what, what? Obviously, that's how they're using it as a dog whistle. Then they'll show oh, dog whistle. What, what's that one? What's up? Frankers? Is that what that is? You, know, the, you can tie anything. I just should just start writing parodies under another name, shouldn't I? Like about all this shit, like. Right, other Overwatch teams. Here's a question for you. What do you think of the London Spitfire gods? This was a team that was looking fantastic and then not so fantastic last stage. What do you think of them? Well, I think a lot of the issues are just not based on the players that they have. I think that their their performance is not um, doesn't really represent their their rosters. I guess their rosters. I say rosters because it's like two different teams, yes. right? Uh, I think that does play a major part in their uh, lack of success. Um, I think they're they're probably kind of split. And from what I from what I do know about them, it's they haven't had really really strong um, leadership within the team yet. Um, I think that probably takes a major major part of their their failure. They probably need uh, a new head coach, or maybe they already have one. I don't really know, but I do know that in the in the first few stages, they had a lot of issues due to not having a lot of leadership within the team you know people as far as i understand uh, their leaders were fisher and rascal yikes <laughs> that's what that's what i understand is that what rascal I mean, told you 
I mean, I think I've heard that from multiple sources. <laughs> I mean, I can I can tell you one thing that I know about Rascal because that's what matters is that I know that Rascal can be a leader. I know that he's very smart. I know that like, yeah, he's young and he might be immature sometimes, but at the same time, he is definitely like a team captain kind of player. So I I believe it, and I know that Fisher is the same way. I'm I'm I've heard nothing but like, oh, Fisher's doing gladiator strategy. They're calling blah 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 blah. So. I mean, I, b- I believe it. It could be the case. I mean, maybe getting rid of those two players was a problem that uh, that wasn't really foreseen by whoever made those decisions. So it does seem as though coming into Overwatch League, one of the most undervalued aspects was coaching staff, because almost every team has added different coaches during the stages, and some people even have swapped head head coach. <laughs> maybe uh, just out of field. It wasn't just a shot at you. I, I it's like half that, the teams have. No, I, I think, think that the bigger problem is that uh, no team, or I would say at least th- at least two thirds of the teams are not giving their their staff power the power that they need to to effectively coach or manage the team. I think that that's probably the bigger issue. It definitely wasn't like a a Dallas thing specifically, or like I think that it goes to many, many different teams. Well, doesn't it kind of make sense from the orcs perspective when they have such like so much value in the players they perceive to well the value they yeah, perceive to have that, in the players? That is the problem. But then also the lack of experience from a lot of the coaches. And I'm not talking about your case. Obviously you're one of the people that has the qualifications, I would say, to be a head coach of a team. But besides Apex coaches in North America, there's not very many people that really have that that history. They don't have a lot uh of things in the past that they've done as a coach that could be like, hey, look at this. You should trust I don't think me it with all matter. the value. I think that if you're going to hire a head coach, you need to give him the responsibilities and the power to do his job. Otherwise, there's no point yeah. anyway. I think yeah. there wasn't a lot of due diligence that was done by many of the teams uh, in order to select the head coaches. And also, uh, something that's bothered me a lot about endemic esports teams throughout esports history is that they will not put enough power in their coaches uh, in order to actually see what the result is. They keep like the owners or the managers will meddle in ways. Um, and that's not very effective in actually judging how good the coach is. And if you need a coaching change, I, it's been my personal belief that you need to invest all that power in them. And I, I think that a lot of the non endemic sports teams are going to be better at this because I know personally that when Boston was looking for somebody to run the team, because I literally myself had a conversation with Jonathan Kraft about this, was that they were looking very much for, they said, this is how we, we, we like to run things in New England. We want a very strong centralized leadership figure. We want to find a Bill Belichick who's going to run the team and be the authority. That's what they wanted. They came in to Overwatch League wanting that person, and Huck was the person that they decided was the best person to fill that role for them. So they were always, the ownership was always looking for that vertical structure. But that's what most traditional sports teams are used to, whereas esports teams, the owners typically meddle too much. And there's only one Huck right now, isn't there? I mean, uh, what about Tucker? <laughs> I, I mean, Tucker manages the team, but he invests a lot of the decision making in his coaches. So the, Tucker is the um, is the manager of the Philadelphia Fusion. But I know from talking to Tucker that he basically he invests all the the power into the coaches, like Kirby and, and BZ and and those guys. So Hui, you know, the uh, the coaches that they have, Hayes. Um, and he doesn't really mess with them, like to the degree that sometimes when I've asked him for access to some of his players or coaches for shows or for visiting their house to watch scrims, he says it's the coach's decision. You know, he doesn't make those decisions. He lets them run the team. Also That's in line actually, team. with <laughs> with what Gods was saying about how there wasn't that many people who had experience, I think it's also telling that like 10 of the 12 teams have a Korean coach in some capacity because basically anyone who was an Apex coach has just been hired at this point in time because no one else has the track record. And also yeah. people just think hiring I, Koreans makes you win, I guess. Yeah, I think that the whole like, oh, we're failing, we need a Korean coach from Apex. I don't even think that's the right answer. I don't think that every coach at Apex was necessarily like the best coach. I think that I think that the LW Blue coaches were good. They're on New York. I think that Krusty's good. But 
beyond that, like our Hope Curie's good, but beyond that, none of them really stood out as like, okay, these are this is a really good coach. Like he belongs in L. So I don't know. It's weird, but still, like, like that goes back to what I was saying. Like, if you hire a coach, a head coach, you ha- they have to have the power. They have to have the responsibilities. Otherwise, you'll never know what they're capable of. I agree. What totally. like what they can I grow agree. into anything. I agree with you. When I was uh, giving reasoning, I wasn't arguing against that. I 100 percent agree with you. If you're ever going to have a head coach, they need to have all of the power of a head coach. I think. I just think it's a huge problem, especially for North American teams, how there hasn't been that much infrastructure uh, pre-Overwatch League for coaches to get their name out there and actually build up a track record. I think um, you have some coaches that um, have gotten credit, but most of them haven't or they're already taken. So I think contenders might be um, the new way for coaches to get their name out there. Um, Like for Raptors, for instance, the coach on my team, I didn't know who he was at all before. But now I realize I respect him a lot as a coach. I think he would do a great job in Overwatch League. So I think it's just time will tell. I think season two of Overwatch League will be a lot more competitive. And I think that coaches will define their teams. So in the last stage, for the first time, the LA Valiant made the playoffs. Actually, wait, is that even accurate? Yes. Yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, they also made it. Yeah. What do, what do you think of Valiant going into stage four? Oh, I mean, I think Valiant really was overrated because they had so many easy opponents at the start of the last stage. They didn't have to play New York until they got smashed by them in the playoffs. Um, it's I actually I, I believe they don't play London next stage. I'd have to check that to be sure. But they've had they've had a, a very preferable schedule. Let's put it that way, at the very least. And I. I. Uh, <laughs> I think it's Seoul they don't play. They do play. Oh, like, is it? Okay, it's Seoul they don't play. So. Oh, no, they they play all three Korean teams, actually. Never mind. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, I was mistaken about that do then. Do they not play? I'd have Check. to... It would be either Fusion, Houston, or Florida, I think. Yeah. No, they play Houston and Florida... They play San I think, Francisco. I think, I think it's Philadelphia. I think they don't. Yeah, so it had to be. It had to be fusion then. You said yeah. they played all three Korean teams. So anyway, um, I, I think that they got off a little bit easy. I think that their DPS is not exactly ideal right now, and I'm not sure how they're going to do super well in the next stage of competition on this patch with the DPS core that they have. Like they're really reliant on agilities for projectile and bunny literally before like this stage and bunny being on the valiant he had played I looked it up on all of his previous teams combined he had played less than 10 minutes on everything except for tracer he had never played a hero besides tracer for more than 20 10 minutes combined in his entire career before this stage. So I, I mean, I still think Soon's underrated, though. Like, I think even Soon can play like project some projectile heroes like Junkrat, and I think that his tracer is one of the best and the, like probably the most consistent. He's not like the best tracer in terms of like where his his highs are, but he is probably the most like consistently above average. But the thing is, of all the teams that are playoff contenders, this sort of thing. The DPS is a bit underwhelming overall for that team, right? It's. I think that, like, from what I noticed, uh, it's going to sound like bad, but from what I noticed, like, going against them with Outlaws, like, I did a lot of the counter strats for, for Valiant as Outlaws and the, the prep for them, and I felt like, I feel like the fact that Valiant has five coaches, I feel like their strategies just weren't where they should be. And I feel like their their mix up from week to week is just not not where it needs to be when you have five coaches. Like I think that they have much room to grow in the in the staff department, in my opinion. Uh, I think their all, players all, all the opposite of grow to some degree. Remove people. I don't know. I don't think removing people and in Overwatch League season one is even like a smart thing, especially staff, because like, yes, like <laughs> staff on every team are going to make mistakes. It's the first season. But okay. I think like I think the orgs and the players should still like respect that it's the first season and things need to be learned. And like 
like just work with the people like see if they actually can get better see if they learn from their mistakes see if they can grow maybe give them more responsibilities maybe change their responsibilities but like just see where they're at like i don't think dropping people in in the first season like even the first half of the first season i just feel like it's so not right in many many situations i mean even outside of myself um but yeah i think balanced players for the most part are fine like i think that the trade between unco and Custa was probably good for both it benefited both teams for sure it definitely benefited dallas i think it benefited uh uh valiant uh it would have been best i I think for for dallas at least if we could have kept custa and and got unco but shit happens but i think valiant is is they had i think they i feel like they have everything they need so but i agree with monty in the fact that like they were overrated because of their opponents in the first two weeks this stage i don't know who's playing bridget for them yet I don't know who their like main DPS flex is going to be or who they've chosen to be. I would imagine it's either. I mean, Space seemed pretty. Uh, space has pretty been great good when he came in the league, right? Space is really good. Space is probably. Space is definitely one of the the top three divas, I'd say, but pr- maybe even top two. But he definitely like has a weakness. I don't feel like I should say what it is on the show like this. But I feel like a humble brag. It, okay, it's a it's a very it's a weakness that's very easy to exploit. But okay. well, by the gracious magnanimous mercy of Kai Kai, you get to continue to be a special <laughs> player space. But if you ever cross him, he will fucking end you, mate. With one tweet, <laughs> your career will be done. He has that power. I don't know. I mean, like, is it? Would it be normal for me to say what it is on a show like this? I feel like it's not. Well, here's the I thing. don't really know. It depends. I mean, here's the thing. You're not on his team. Why do you give a fuck? <laughs> it's like a respect yeah. thing. Well, do you respect him? If you really respect him, then you know that he'd improve and figure out whatever the problem is and he'd just get better as a player. So no, no biggie, right? I mean, maybe he, maybe he, know, I mean, I'm sure he knows about it. Like it, it makes sense that he knows about it. <laughs> it's really not like a complex thing. Like, oh, I'm some mastermind genius that just like analyzes stats. Yeah. It's, it's not even like a statistical thing. It's just a play style thing. But yeah, enough about well, that. Well, you've teased and give us blue balls on that one, so <laughs> let's move on from that. Let's move on. Apparently never going to get to find out what it is, so just live with that for the rest of our lives. Put that away in the memory hole with all the Dallas fuel Space stuff is very, very, about. very, very good. If I was to build a Western team, Space would be like probably the number one diva I would look at. Okay. Not bad. What do you think about Space as a player, God's? Considering I think he's incredible. I think he's really, really good. If you had to guess what his weakness is, what do you think it would be? <laughs> um, <laughs> heroes besides Hog and Diva. If he was forced to flex, he may not actually perform that well if it was something that was in the moment. I mean, critiquing a, a flex player's hero pool is kind of weird. Sometimes I mean, like, isn't really? more flexible? He's, Critiquing a flex player. I mean, it's not like <laughs> kind, <laughs> kind of a job. I, I mean, when I said play style, it was a completely different thing. Okay. But in terms of hero pool for a, for a flex tank, I think that like he actually has one of the the bigger ones relative to all of the all of Overwatch League flex tank players because he can play DPS stuff. I know that he plays soldier really well. I know that he can play flex or like some of the DPS heroes at least. I mean, that would be the only thing I could guess that would be his weakness. I mean, I know that his D.Va and let's, Hog are really strong, but I don't know about his, his Zarya and everything else, so. So, okay, you touched on this earlier, Kai Kai, that since Boston Uprising has lost their head coach, and as yet they have not announced who's going to be the head coach as far as I know, or if they're promoting one of the assistants to be the head coach. When you say it'll, it'll you think it'll mean they'll take a hit, and obviously they went undefeated before the playoffs, in what respect like do you think that coaching was like integral to them having these results it wasn't just that the players were a good mix and played off each other well or whatever i think that if they can continue to run dive which might be the case on 1.22 don't i don't know yet i don't know one way or the other but i think if they can continue to run that i think they'll be fine i think they're going to take a little bit of a hit in that way if they have to learn a new meta they might take a little bit bigger of a hit but I do think that Huck's structure for that team is still like really good, and I think that they're gonna 
they're still going to be a good team. I just think that without Crusty, they're not as strong. Or do you think God's about Boston? Yeah. Or about the coach? Boston. Um, I think Boston has surpassed my expectations uh, at every turn. Um, I think moving forward, having mistakes play, I think mistakes has a lot of uh, potential as a player. And so I think they're only going to get better, but it's, I don't know if this meta will be very kind to them because I think it's a little bit eccentric. I think it's a little bit weird. I think they've played, historically, they've played um, very basic comps very well. But I don't know how well they're going to do playing weirder comps and having to focus more on having DPS stars carry them. So we'll see. I think I think it depends which patch goes through. But uh, if it's something more dive-oriented, I'm sure they'll do well. What do you think, Monty? Did seeing them get crushed flat by the NY XL <laughs> and say will be literally just... Hey, they put up a, they put up a pretty good fight. Them. They, they put up a pretty good fight. I mean, a lot of those maps were actually quite close, but um, I do think that it's good that Striker has already started to move out and play some other heroes, like his Junkrat is really good, for example. Uh, I think it just depends on how much fundamentally the game's strategies are going to change with whichever patch that we're on, because... Playing if if dive becomes not an an optimal way to play the game a game anymore, I think we have to ask which teams are going to be affected by that. And Boston would certainly be at the top of that list. And if they got rid of a coach that was very good at teaching them new play styles, then that may have been the wrong time to get rid of or to lose Krusty as a coach. Um, so that that could cause them problems. I think it's I think in terms of teams that are affected by dive, like probably them, London will be affected pretty significantly um but at least london i think has more versatile dps players um i think mistakes is getting better mistakes i thought would not perform as well as he did individually as he did in the in the playoffs this past stage so that was an encouraging sign for them uh Kellex, i think is probably the weakest member of that team currently and he was targeted pretty heavily by new york he was dying like twice as much i think he ended up dying more than two times as much as arc did over the course of that series so that might be a hole that they need to patch up we haven't seen very many of their other support players though so well, perhaps you saw they've just brought in aim god that korean player yep so maybe they, they also have part of the and snow on the bench that have just been sitting there doing nothing and Kalios. and Kalios for the zarya that's very true so they have some depth, but I, I think it. I, I think they'll probably continue to do well. They may have peaked in this last stage. I, I'm not sure if they're going to continue to to play it quite at that level of consistency because that would be, I think, a challenge for them. Actually, let's let's ask about this topic. So something we referred to in the last week, well, when a couple of weeks ago when we had Hawk on. So some teams have taken the approach of they have their starters, and then if they want to work someone into the lineup, they do. But some people just never play. And in fact, there are some people on Overwatch League rosters who just haven't played a game. They all they've played five minutes or something. You know, what do you think about that, Kai Kai? Should if you have a functional team, should you try and give everyone some kind of practice time? Should people like, in some sense, is it better to just focus on the main starting core and just try and get them the best they can? What do you think of the different approaches we've seen? I think that having like internal scrims and even like using your your subs or whatever in scrims is definitely like good. You definitely want to give everyone some kind of play time in scrims and like just to, even if it's just for the case of like, oh, you're going to play one day a week and we're just going to evaluate like your progression from week to week to just to see where you're at make like make sure you're maintaining your, like some kind of synergy with the team. I think that's very important in terms of like play time on stage. I think that um, having a core like core starters is probably like the route that every team is going to have to go. And I think that a lot of players are having a hard time accepting and dealing with the maybe not being a starter right now. Like uh even though like it's overwatch league i think people some people were always like i'd prefer to be on the bench of an owl team than i would in contenders but it's hard to tell if people are changing their minds or not i really don't know because like players are starting to get really antsy about playtime. i know that uh i do think though that like it needs to be it needs to be six starters 
like whether or not you're gonna have a sub for like a specific map type or map is one thing i think new york does it in a good way but but at the end of the day i think everyone has to have play time in some way or another at least in scrims and i think internal scrims from what i've gathered we ne- we can never do them in dallas but in houston i think that internal scrims are like probably uh the, probably the best practice you can get okay do you have any thoughts scots uh yeah i would say that there's obviously a huge difference between uh, as a player being a sub versus being benched like someone who's being told to focus on being good at playing a certain map or a certain hero is completely different than just being like well you're never going to scrim you're never going to get to progress as a player or get your chance for the main roster i think um it i think teams as time goes on will start to implement um having dps subs for different maps um you see teams already doing that but i think it's going to become more popular I think as far as uh, the main and off tank roles pretty much need to remain consistent, but I think every other role, depending on map, can change. And I think it's super valuable to have obviously more than more than just one main tank and one off tank that you're playing, just because you need to have the option to run more than just two tanks without having your DPS players have to grind those. And so I do find it super useful. Um, for teams to have players that they just tell to focus on certain things and play them in certain situations, as opposed to just being like, oh, here's our starting six, we're just going to play them on every map, and then maybe have subs. I think it's something that teams should definitely focus on moving forward. Wait, guys, if I was to tell you that I'd pick you up for a team, <laughs> again, I'll say I'd pick you up for a team. And then <laughs> Real could, this time. <laughs> and, then, and then you could be like, you could, we would do be doing internal scrims on like maybe a daily basis, and you would just be like, on the B team, basically, and then like over time, like if you were to show enough growth and enough progression, you could potentially become a starter. But it would take like a serious statement from your end. Would would that be something that you would be okay with as a player? As a player, for me, that would. There, there's kind of two different things besides being a starter that would interest me. Interest me for Owl. There's one is like being brought in as a specialist for a hero, like something I'm already good at, Roadhog or something like that. And the other one would obviously be like, okay. You're going to be on the B team. You're going to play every single day. But I think for me, that would be enough of an opportunity. That would be more of an opportunity for me um, to prove myself as a player simply because Contenders so far hasn't offered me, enabled me to to prove myself in an optimal way, I feel like. Um, obviously, I don't have the best competition. I don't have the best setup. I, you know, I live with my parents right now. Um, stuff like that. It all it all kind of adds up to the point where, yeah, I would. I think any player would be dumb not to to consider that, for sure. If that was put before them. Yeah, I don't know. I think I feel like just maybe since it's the first season, the players that didn't have to go through like Overwatch League is above me, and I'm in contenders. Maybe like just people that went straight into Overwatch League and then became like the B team or the a bench player. Like they they're just having a hard time dealing with it. But maybe it's just a reality check. Well, I think the the thing that is most important for the the contenders owl relationship is the two way contracts. And there's been a lot of talk about implementing two way contracts so that there's more free movement. So, like gods, for example, you know, in, in a situation where like Remix isn't the starting tank anymore on Gladiators, maybe he comes down to Gladiators Legion to be your starting tank, but you can't like move players up and down every week you have to there's like a cool down period where you can move them down there and then two weeks later they can move again but i think that would be much better for most teams that way you have more flexibility with your roster moving players up and down between contenders and overwatch league yeah it would definitely help the players that are not being used as subs that are actually benched to be able to get some experience and if nothing else you know prove themselves in contenders in a way so yeah that that makes a lot of sense i think that that should be something that's implemented as soon as possible. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's definitely there's definitely an intention to do that for next year. It makes sense. 